Okay, so I don't have actionable in the title at least. Um, but I'm going to say it a lot. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the Emerge Consortium and in particular our experience with um, trying to determine what are um, returnable variants. So, oh, it's not working. Um, so the Emerge Network is a consortium of uh, institutions through a UON mechanism funded by NHGRI um, where we took GWAS data, <coughs> 660K or million chips, and um, phenotypes from electronic medical record. And through the consortium, we all shared genotypes, and then we could get our phenotypes from the other sites. So there are about 18,000 people in what we're now calling Emerge 1. Emerge was renewed this year to Emerge 2, which added Geisinger and Mount Sinai to the existing uh, sites. And the, the um, number of subjects is increasing all the time. And it's turned out to be a very, very productive consortium, not just because of the data that we can access, but also because of this interesting blend of people where we have you know, the informatics people, we have the statistical people, we have the molecular people, we have the ethicists, we have the clinicians, and we've all been able to really interact and learn from each other, and this committee is a good example of that. Um, so uh, the consortium formed a consent and community consultation work group, and that work group in turn charged a return of results oversight committee to talk about what results were potentially returnable. So ju just to say that there's a lot of people um, in the original return of results work group and then the oversight committee actually added more people. And what's interesting about the people who are here um, is that there is a blend of clinical people and I have the clinical train. It's really hard to shoot it, but anyway, I have the clinical training in the um, right column. Um, but there's also the informatics people, um, molecular people, statistical people, um, and so it was an interesting blend. The, the one disadvantage of that uh, is that we all had to educate each other about our perspective, <laughs> which took more time than I think if a bunch of docs had sat down, but it, but it did broaden out the discussion considerably, and so I found it very valuable personally. Um, so, these were GWAS studies, so it's a different kind of results. Um, so that we're looking mostly at common variants, so most of them aren't going to be high penetrance things that simplified our job. Um, there were, however, some incidental findings that we expected to find and have to deal with, and then we expect future uh, issues when we're looking at copy number variation. We've actually already seen some deletions that are associated with um, bone marrow dyscrasias. Um, and then uh, we are now in Emerge 2 employing a um, pharmacogenetic array of many, many, many genes that will give us a lot more actionability. So, okay, so these were the players in Emerge 1, Group Health, Marshfield, Mayo, and Northwestern. And um, there, there are about 18,000 people in Emerge 1. These are the new updated totals which are going up. Uh, but there's some variability among these groups. So group health, for example, the me median age of the cohort is 74. Um, for Marshfield, it's 48. Uh, there's a lot of variability. Every cohort had about 40% men, which is typical, except for Mayo, which had a peripheral vascular disease study, and they had about 60% men. Most of the cohorts were very white with uh, at least some representation of um, non-Caucasians at Northwestern and Vanderbilt. So not everybody was exactly the same. Um, we used the guidelines from the FABCITS paper on um, reporting research results. Basically, it is an actionability standard of if there, there is medical utility to the information, it should go back to the patient. I've highlighted in blue here that for the members of our committee were on that paper, so it's no surprise that we, were, <laughs> that we liked it. Um, and this paper, I, I want to give credit to the original Bookman paper, which um, set out the standards, and, and the FEBSITS paper was really an update for newer kinds of data. Um, so uh, now I'll give credit to Chris O'Donnell, whose group nicely put together a beautiful paper on what are the variants on a GWAS chip that are used by clinical labs, and that saved us a ton of time, and I highly recommend taking a look at that if you're interested in what's actionable on a GWAS chip. 
Um, it, this is anything that's used by a clinical lab, so it's not necessarily our standard of what's medically relevant because some of these things here are autosomal recessive, high penetrance early in life. And so the person would know, we decided to follow up on factor V Leiden and hemochromatosis. We decided not to follow up on hereditary pancreatitis where there is a variant on the chip that has an odds ratio around four or five for pancreatitis. So. Um, the, we were given a specific charge by the um, ethics committee, which was to look at what would change medical care. We were asked to not look at something that impacts reproductive status, i.e., we were told not to consider variant uh, in the carrier state for a recessive disorder. And then, very importantly, we're an oversight committee and all IRB decisions are local. So we are advisory, but we are not telling people what to do. And we tried to be very careful in our language to make, say, it's potential, everything was potentially returnable. We didn't say anything was, had to be returned. Everything's potentially returnable. So we struggled with the criteria for defining what is clinically actionable, what actually gives direct <laughs> benefit to the patient medically, not just information that the patient might like to have, but actually would change medical care. Um, we are avoiding the CLIA issues for the purposes of this talk. Um, none of these results were, were done in CLIA labs. Um, and then we were charged with talking about how results might be returned and, and probably most importantly, documenting what the results were that were found. So uh, it was interesting that ethics people didn't realize, of course, the GWAS people did, that the first thing you find are chromosome um, <laughs> anomalies, Turner syndrome and Kleinfelter. It's the very first thing you get because it jumps out on the QC when your genders don't match what they're supposed to match or when you have extra X's in the presence of a Y. Um, so those were the first things that we dealt with. Um, again, we we're being very specific to the data we had and then um, the hemochromatosis and the factor V Leiden. Factor V Leiden, as it happens, it, that variant is only present on the one million chip, and that was run in a small minority of our samples because th those were directed at non-Caucasian samples. All right, so um, we went disease by disease, and I can say one thing about how to shorten the process, which is that the more people that are at the table or on the call, the longer the discussion is gonna go. And the more diverse the group, the longer the discussion's gonna go. Um, so uh, ultimately, though, we decided that Kleinfelter disease would be potentially returnable um, because there, are, there is health screening that's done in Kleinfelter's patients to avoid important diseases. In particular, testosterone is very useful um, in Kleinfelter's. Um, notably, in clinical care, you come across incidental Kleinfelters when you do bone marrows, and they're just universally returned. Like, nobody thinks twice about it. If you come across a Kleinfelters, you just give it back to them. The patients are very favorable, and their general response is, well, that explains a few things, you know. <laughs> so out of the 10 uh, Kleinfelters we found, Four of them were known in the MR, so it was really an advantage for us to be able to go back to the electronic medical record and say, do these people know about this? We don't have to return it if they already know about it, and that's an advantage every study won't have. And all, every IRB at every site allowed us to do that. Um, happily for us, the one mosaic Kleinfelters was among the known cases, so we didn't have to deal with separately, you know, if he's a mosaic, does he need to know? Is that as actionable as, uh, and, and I might add, um, you can be a mosaic because you lost a, I mean, you are a mosaic because you lost a chromosome along the way. The question is just, where did you lose it? Did you lose it in your bone marrow and so you have a full Kleinfelter's phenotype? Or did you lose it, you know, and your whole body is not, um, is not XXY? Um, of the six that were potentially returnable, i.e., they were Kleinfelter's, but we were, um, unable to find it in the electronic medical record because, of course, some of those people may have a diagnosis that just didn't find its way into the um, medical record. And in fact, one of the ones we're calling known actually had Turner's in his medical record, but we're, we're sure they knew that it was Kleinfelter's and not Turner's since it was a male. Um, but <laughs> of this, we're, we're thinking so. Um, of the, it just says something about the medical records and also the doctors. <laughs> um, 
of, the, of those six, uh, one was already deceased, um, and so that was you know, not returnable. One had documented genitourinary um, abnormalities and was on testosterone, and so even though they didn't have Klinefelters, they were doing an appropriate treatment. The remaining four were all at Mayo, and there was a local decision at Mayo to not return Klinefelters, um, which we, we could talk about, but I don't want to take a lot of time on because it's it was a long, protracted discussion. It never went to the IRB at Mayo, though. It was uh, um, within the study group. Um, so when we turn to Turner syndrome, again, uh, there was a general feeling that most Turners know their Turners, um, but that some Turners could escape. Turners is a little more complicated for a couple of reasons, but there are good reasons to know if you have Turner syndrome. Um, if you're young, knowing about the infertility, of course, is helpful. If you're older, there are some complications. Um, Turners are treated with estrogen, and they do have more medical screening. Interestingly, the two patients that clearly had Turners, an XO and an um, X, uh, XQ minus, so missing the um, long arm of one of the Xs, those were known in the EMR. We had eight other mosaic Turners, um, XO, XX, um, and, and those can be acquired. And many of these patients actually were quite older. They, um, four of them were from the group health study, and they were in their 70s. Um, and so there is well-documented loss of the X chromosome in the bone marrow, so that can be just an acquired change that doesn't represent Turner syndrome at all. Um, out of those eight, three were deceased. Um, there were five of those eight had children documented in the EMR. Only in one case, though, did actual births and pregnancies appear in the EMR, so you don't know if children are adopted. One of those eight patients, though, was documented to be infertile in the EMR. And, and none of these have been returned. I'll come back to that. Um, so factor V Leiden, um, there was a sort of a sophisticated, <laughs> nuanced, um, uh, that homozygotes should be returned and heterozygotes not, um, because the, his, the risk of a DBT or PE is so much higher in homozygotes, and the interventions for heterozygotes are slight. Um, so, but there was some discussion, and there was also a discussion of is there some age after which you would not tell the homozygotes anymore because they would have presented by now. Hemochromatosis um, was the longest discussion. So it's autosomal recessive. It has a penetrance of 10% in males, only 1% in females. Uh, it causes serious complications in death. Um, and the prevention is really actually quite simple of using phlebotomy to keep off the excess iron. Um, and screening by ferritin level, very simple. There is not population, uh, a recommendation for population screening in hemochromatosis, um, but the group felt very strongly that what we're doing isn't population screening. If you know the genotype, is there a different uh, level of burden to tell the person? Um, so ultimately, there was a mixed opinion on this one, but the general sense was to return in males and not to return in females. And of course, that's what we had a little debate about because we had some members of the group who were uncomfortable of with treating males and females differently. But in this case, the risks are truly different. Um, and I should say in hemochromatosis, of course, if someone comes into clinic and says, my brother has hemochromatosis, we always test them. We don't, you know, we don't go like, well, maybe you don't need to know. We just do it. Um, so coming back to what all the findings were, I talked about um, the Turner's and the Kleinfelter. For factor V Leiden, three of the groups didn't have the one million chip at all, and for the two groups that did have the one million chip, they elected to not review the data. In fact, the, the allele for factor V Leiden is quite rare in African American populations, and so the possibility of finding homozygote was quite low, but nobody looked. Um, for, he for hemochromatosis, group health is the only site that did not look, and that's because the patients were so elderly that it was decided that it wouldn't be clinically relevant for them at that point. Um, for um, Marshfield, they found 14 people who were homozygotes for the, um, the major site. Six of those were male. They found five of those had a diagnosis in the EMR, which is an interesting proportion. Um, and in the rest, there were no symptoms in, in the EMR. They actually reviewed for heart disease, other kinds of liver disease. And because they could not find symptoms, they decided not to return. At Mayo, 
Um, they had about, they had 14, five also in the EMR, and they decided that they, they have not decided about return yet. They're still in the process. At Northwestern, um, they found six, two in the EMR. They felt that they could not return. This is the new gene cohort. They don't, they're not consented for return, and they also don't really have contact with the subjects. And finally, for Vanderbilt, um, they just have no ability to get back to the original subjects. It's a de-identified data set. Um, I, I skipped over for Kleinfelters, the one returnable Kleinfelters that we had at Group Health. We decided we would return it, uh, and the patient turned out to be deceased. So that saved that. So the conclusions, uh, first of all, Malia Fullerton uh, wrote up our experience, and that paper was submitted to Genetics and Medicine. It came back for um, very minor revisions, so hopefully that will be in press in Genetics and Medicine, and, and there's a lot more to the story that will be in that paper. Certainly, we found that incidental findings are going to remain a, an issue in research studies, but I think that applies to a clinical genome when, you're, when you do an exome or or a genome looking for a cancer gene and you find other things, you really need to be prepared for how you're going to handle that information. Clinically actionable is a highly debatable term, and, um, and importantly, and I think we didn't really appreciate this going in, it depends on the clinical context a lot. So it depends if you're male, it depends if you're female, it depends on what age you are, it will depend on what race you are, and many other factors. Do you, do you still want to have children? If you don't want to have children, then needing to know if you're infertile is not a priority. And so I think that that's something that's going to be very hard to operationalize. Um, in EMERGE 2, we divided this work into two committees. There's the CERC committee, which is community education and a couple other letters I should have looked up. Um, and the other is the Actionable Variant Committee, and so, uh, you know, maybe you can get them to rename the committee. I didn't name it, <laughs> but I, I'm a co-chair with Iftikhar Kulo. Um, and for the Actionable Variant Committee, we're going to be looking at risk scores, particularly for cardiovascular disease, and then because we'll be getting this large amount of pharmacogenomic data, we'll be looking at those variants, and those are our next steps. Thank you. Questions or comments? Helen? Gail, I may miss this uh, at the beginning, uh, but what was the consent status uh, in all the different sites about actionability? Yeah, that, th you barely missed it. It was on one of the slides, but the fact was that most of the cohorts were not consented for return. Two of the cohorts were consented to return, but for the other four sites, each IRB indicated that if there was some compelling reason that they would consider that. And one of the things we had a long, they would consider actually returning results despite what the consent form said. We had a very long discussion about how you ask people if they want results without telling them they have results. Um, and so in, in group health, they actually went back and they just reconsented the whole cohort. Um, well, everyone who they were still able to get. Um, when, because that cohort started out as an Alzheimer's disease discovery cohort, you know, 15 years ago, and nobody really thought that they, they'd find anything interesting, like genetically, in that cohort. Um, so I've reconsented several cohorts related to other studies because we didn't anticipate at the time of the original consent. And, and at UW, that's our IRB's preferred process, that you reconsent the whole cohort for return of potentially interesting results with this giant disclaimer that you may not ever be giving them any, but you just want to know. Um, and that way you're not stuck with, well, here are four people I'd like to tell. How do I ask them if they want the information without tipping off that I have something useful for them? So, it's, so we go with just try and reconsent everybody. It's not as efficient necessarily, but it, it allows them to really make a choice. Uh, Bruce had a comment. Could I ask you to clarify the comment in one of your slides that said this is not screening? What did you mean? Oh, yeah. So we're talking about hemochromatosis and, and the fact that there is no recommendation for population screening for hemochromatosis, that the cost benefit is felt to not be worthwhile for screening. What's not screening about this is we actually have the genetic data. 
So that's the distinction I'm making. And we're not spending any money to get the data. We may spend money to do something with the data, but the data is sitting there. The other comment that I'd like to add to that is that Bookman and FabSits both took the position, and we took two, that no one's, even if you have the data, you're not required to look at it. You're not required to go digging through your data to find everything that's potentially clinically relevant. But if you, ha if you are stumbling across it, like the karyotypes that you can't ignore, you, ha you find them, um, then, then that's where your burden starts to, to decide if you're going to return that information. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, it answers the question. I guess I would debate whether it was screening or not. The, the, the fact that you did the test could be construed as screening after the fact, I understand your point. Okay. <laughs> uh, one more question, Terry. Uh, yeah, thanks, Gil. You made a very good point about um, really the, what, what's actionable and, and not depends on the clinical context. But then you said something about the, that it might depend on race ethnicity. Did I hear you correctly? And if so, could you explain? Well, penetrance, penetrance may be race specific. So as we move to variants that risk scores, genetic risk scores, for example, those may become race specific. And I, you know, I'm particularly concerned about those. <laughs> and certainly the, then the risk scores are primarily built around Caucasians because that's where our data is. We don't have very much information. So, so certainly there's no reason to believe that if, uh, you know, most variants do translate across. If they increase risk in this race, they increase risk. But the amount that they increase risk, by the time you're talking about odds ratio, may not be the same at all. And then the spectrum of variants is going to be different across uh, races. So certainly for Turner syndrome, I'm not worried about race, but for a, a risk score, it's, I'm more concerned. Yeah, I think we, we need to be real careful of, of that. And I, and I agree with you that the data may not be there, but what, what tends to happen then is people say, well, we only have data in European ancestry people, so we can't say anything about anyone else. And I would disagree. Uh, well, I can say a lot about people. Right, I, I totally agree with that statement. I, I, and in fact, I've heard I was at a seminar recently where someone said, well, you know, none of this helps people who aren't white, and I vehemently uh, disagreed with that statement. It's, it, many of these things will translate, um, but you, you know, you have to decide what your cutoffs are. If you're looking at a 10 or 15 percent increased risk, that may be a 5 or even a 20 percent increased risk a across a different background. Right, but we, we did have this problem with the back of beer and, and HLAB. 5701, that basically, oh, there are no data in, in you know, non-European ancestry, so we can't use it. And even though it's rare, if it's there, it's something. Right. For high penetrance alleles, I don't think that that race is an issue. I think it's really for these low penetrance things. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put my stamp on that. Thanks for bringing that point up, though. I didn't mean to muddle, muddle that. Okay. Thank you very much. Gail. Thank you. Uh, we're exactly on time. We have to break now, so we'll meet exactly at 1 o'clock.